I've designed 15 living rooms on my own, and these are the color rules that I swear by. At least according to Lucy from Homes and Gardens. Yes, we are reacting to another article today recommended by one of you all, so thank you so much. This is a really interesting one. I haven't really read through it, but I skimmed through it. I always love going through these because it's nice to get someone else's opinion on color. And you know I love my color. Ask yourself how you want the room to feel and make a mood board. So this is a two-parter here. I first of all love the idea of thinking about the overarching theme or mood of the room that you're designing. What kind of activities are going to be going on in that room? Is it more of a relaxation space? Is it more of an invigorating space where you want to learn or you want to work or play? Whatever the case may be. All that needs to go into your color selection process. The mood board aspect of it is something that I haven't really done a lot recently. Maybe it's just my process has changed over the years. But for a lot of people, by creating a mood board and gathering little bits and images and sort of putting them all together in a collage, you can extract colors from that mood board, which is always kind of nice and very useful. I do tend to notice though, when it comes to mood boards, sometimes you end up picking the brightest and most vibrant and fun color of that mood board and then you throw it on your walls only to realize, man, that's too much, dude. Oftentimes those boring colors that maybe don't stand out are the ones that are more suitable in practical use on your walls, especially. But that's just me. I settle on three main colors for my space. And this I love because we're talking about the 60, 30, 10 rule, which is a tried and true classic approach to color selection in interior decorating. Essentially means you have three primary colors that you're working with. One encompassing 60% of the space, one that's 30%, and then one that's 10%. Normally you have your primary color, a secondary choice, and then your accent color, just to sort of spice things up. This doesn't mean that you only have three colors to work with, because in this room alone, I have some purple light, I got some yellow in the background, green trees, green walls, taupe rugs, brown desk. All it really means is on a broader scale, that's how you should be thinking of it. You have your main color that can encompass your walls and maybe your ceilings. You have a, you have a floor color that could also tie into your furniture. And then you have something else that is just different, which is that 10%. It's a simple, easy way to get your proportions right. We're all about proportionizing here, okay? Assessing your room's natural daylight to get wall color tones right. This is a very important consideration to make. Although I do think that people can complicate this whole aspect of color selection where you're first analyzing, okay, well, what exposure is my light coming from? Is it north facing, south facing, north, northwest, south, south, north? <laughs> that possible? No. And while there is some useful information in knowing all that, at the end of the day, you just got to test the colors out. It's the most boring answer ever, but it is the truth. Because even if your room is facing south and you are getting more of that warm light, you don't know how warm it's going to be because of the drapes that you use and the color of your floors and all of that. So for me, I do think about daylight, temperature and all that. But at the end of the day, the process is going to be the same. You just test the colors out, see if it looks good. And then the author continues on to ceilings. And this is the part where I kind of think we're getting in the weeds a little bit. Essentially, she's saying you want to make sure you nail the tone of your ceiling to also work with the daylight that you're getting. One thing that I will say is I do like the idea of having similar tones or at least similar temperatures, let's say, for your walls and your ceiling. So if you do decide to tint your ceiling one way or another, it might make more sense to go warmer if you're going warmer on your walls. And I do think it's fun that the author thinks of the ceiling sometimes as a fifth wall. Chances are you you might just be better off going with a stark white. I think pure white ceilings tend to serve you better in a lot of cases, mainly from the practical element of reflecting more light. So if you have any light that hits your ceiling, it becomes its own sort of light source, reflecting light back down into the room. That's why I do tend to default to white ceilings, but I think it can get quite daunting if you're now having to worry about a fifth wall. You gotta worry about these four first. And also a quick shout out to ceiling wallpaper. I love wallpaper on the ceilings, especially in like a powder room. We then get into color swatches and not just for paint which I think is a really fun little detail everything that she's thinking of using design wise whether it's fabrics textiles paint of course whatever the case may be she gets them and then she lives with them in the space allowing things to digest mentally to make sure that these are the types of colors that she wants to live with in the space which I think is great and another really important thing she basically has tester boards that she uses hashtag mighty boards and the important thing that she does is she puts one on all four walls and this gives you a much better representation of the color because you get to see it from four different perspectives, different directions of light hitting the room in different ways. You get all of that. So I think that's a really, really nice tip that she sort of mentions that definitely applies to this channel, right? And I think an important aspect of getting swatches of the different materials you're using in a room more than color is you get to see the different textures that are going to be involved.
involved. I love using texture and layering things, but sometimes you can have one sort of taking away from the other. So by having them all together and then really seeing them over a period of days or even weeks, you can get a strong sense of the overall cohesion, which we like. This last point here is huge, and it's something that directly ties into my mindset when it comes to design in general. Accessorizing, but slowly. It's huge, right? So my wife and I, we got this new house recently, and we made a point not to rush into completely finishing and filling the whole space. We got a few really key items that we really loved, and we live with it. And then we add a little thing here, a little thing there, but realizing that life is a big journey, and so is design. What I might love now may change in six months, and in fact, it probably will. So you might as well wait for those really special pieces that will stand the test of time. So the important thing is make sure the space is usable when you're designing a room, get the bare essentials that you really will get use out of, and then add a piece here, some accessories there, maybe some plant life as well to sort of keep the space feeling alive, and then slowly build things as time goes on. That's my best piece of advice. That's quite possibly my favorite thing that Lucy said in this article. If you want to read it yourself, I'll leave it down below. Okay, bye.